Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It is an absolute honor. I've always wanted to maybe come to the Philippines, but I guess we're gonna try and uh, do this over Zoom. And uh, if there's any questions or, or, or uh, I'll put them in the chat then or I'll try to, try to answer them at the end. And today I wanna to go over how I use ultrasound in tendinopathy and, and PRP. Uh, and also I wanna talk a little bit about vitamin D supplementation to mitigate COVID-19. So you can, I'd love to connect with everybody on LinkedIn or on Twitter, and you can find me at those right there. So my, my question to start is a little bit how I got into either PRP and, and ultrasound, but has anybody ever taught you how to be vital? And I think 2020 has been a year where we feel like Sisyphus just pushing this rock uphill all the time. And a lot of us are down here surviving or sliding or maybe even the burnout zone. Uh, and it's an honor to be with you today and try to get you back into the vitality zone because I think in, in musculoskeletal medicine and orthopedic surgery, we really try to focus on enhancing vitality. And that's what we're going to try to be doing over the next 20 minutes or so. So I think vitality is a combination of four different pillars of physical, mental, social, and spiritual, and they're interdependent. And I've been teaching about this at Stanford and have actually published a book on this. You can find it on Amazon if you're interested. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is that it's, it's in that context that we're gonna to talk today about something that I really enjoy and that is ultrasound, tendinopathy and, and platelet-rich plasma. We'll also talk a little bit about um, COVID and vitamin D. I think this is an important um, topic that's under recognized as an area and then I'll I'll try to answer your questions uh, at the end. So when, when we talk about um, why did I start using ultrasound, I started using ultrasound because I was doing a lot of PRP injections and I wanted a way to follow the patients. And what I found over the years is that ultrasound is a phenomenal way, an excellent way to look at tendons. I think in some respects, it's much better than MRI. So one, the, the thing I do the most with PRP is inject into and around an elbow. Uh, you can do it under ultrasonic guidance. I think this is one where it's better to follow the lesions with ultrasound and the, and the pathology with ultrasound. Um, the area where the problem is is, is, is pretty, pretty obvious. And, and you see in this bottom picture down here, uh, this is a surgical uh, case where Whenever I do surgery for, for tennis elbow or at almost any tendon, I add platelet-rich plasma and we're in the process of looking up those, those, those cases right now. So when, what, what happens when you inject PRP, if you look under ultrasound, it sort of spreads out into and around the, the lesion by, uh, you, you can see it on, uh, on ultrasound, but I think there's still a role for MRI. Um, and I, I think this is important because this is the, lesion that you see on MRI, and this is what the ultrasound looks like. These are the same patient here. But this stuff right here you see on ultrasound is, is hard to define because obviously the ultrasound device doesn't penetrate the bone, and it's hard to see some of the cartilage. But when somebody has lateral elbow pain, they, they can have things that are other than, than, than tennis elbow. So there's a little abnormality of the tendon either by ultrasound or by MRI, but it's, it's a significant cartilage thing, cartilage damage that is not, was not seen by plain x-ray. So in this particular case, this is some cartilage debris in the joint and, and some significant degeneration of the cartilage around the capitellum of the elbow. Uh, and I don't think PRP was gonna make a bit of difference for that in, in terms of solving that. It might've made it a little bit better, but. Uh, be wary that ultrasound isn't perfect for, for this. But I think also, I think when we talk about using ultrasound, we have to have some real world decisions. And this is an example of a patient I had uh, who was 45 years old, 18 months of elbow pain. So for those of you who think that it goes away, he had three quarters on injections, a lot of physical therapy and was still having eight out of 10 pain in the outside part of his elbow. The MRI was consistent with the uh, intrasubstance tear uh, and the ultrasound was loss of the echo texture and consistent with the partial tear. And what we did is we just followed him over time using ultrasound. And you can see here, this is before the ultrasound and this is three months later. 
This is a significant change in terms of the overall echo texture of the, of the tendon uh, between one and three months later, and its pain dropped from eight to one out of 10. And these are, this is also what you can do with ultrasound that you can't do with MRI, is you can put that under load and you can say, okay, move your elbow. Uh, again, here's four. Look at the thickening of the tendon and then after. All right, so there's much, much thinner tendon here. And this is a disorganized uh, significant area of tendinopathy. So I think ultrasound is an excellent way to follow patients with chronic lateral epicondylar tendinopathy before and after any injections. The reason I use leukocyte rich PRP is, is this study that I published with uh, many co authors, 230 patients, double blind prospective randomized trial, 12 centers here in the United States. And here's what we found in dry needling as the black and the leukocyte rich PRP is in the, in, the, in the blue here. And these are patients that had at least 50%. Um, can everybody see it? I just saw that some people can see it and not. Dr. Allen is that better? Yeah. Is that better? Can, can people see that? Is that? I don't know why sharing is paused. Uh, Dr. Allen, uh, we cannot see your screen. All right, I'm going to try something here. Let's see, we'll try it again. Can you see that now? Yes, doctor, yes, we can yes, see yes. it. Great, great, great. Okay. Thank you. So, so this is just, I'm sorry, but the data here from one of the studies, and then this is just a review of the literature. There's lots of evidence to suggest that leukocyte-rich PRP can be helpful for lateral epicondylitis and um, may be of a significant clinical evidence. So if you are going to use PRP, for tendinopathy, leukocyte-rich PRP is the, is the way to go. Um, and um, if, you're, if you're looking more for other, other things that ultrasound can do for the elbow, uh, again, I know you guys are experts in this as well, but this is, this is a snapping ulnar nerve. You can see the ulnar nerve is popped over the medial epicondyle right here. And then when you look at that nerve, one of the things I really like about ultrasound is that you can compare, this is the affected side, and you can see that this is a much thicker ulnar nerve than on the, on the right asymptomatic elbow. So 0.43 centimeters versus 0.24 centimeters. And you can, again, see the architecture of the nerve much better on the right than the left. And what you're able to do for the patient is right in there in the office, you're going to be able to say, look, we have a snapping ulnar nerve. It looks worse than the other side can save the money of doing an MRI because this is pretty diagnostic for ulnar neuropathy. Uh, and then this is just an example of medial epicondylar tendinopathy, similar to lateral epicondylar tendinopathy, where there's loss of the echo texture uh, of the elbow, uh, or the tendon, uh, the flexor pronator at the uh, medial epicondyle. And you can see that there. The other thing that I think is important to note, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not people in the Philippines, Middle East, or Asia are using PRP for gluteal tendinopathy. I know that this, this has uh, been, be, been much more uh, common here in the United States now. So if you have a partial gluteal tendon tear or gluteal tendinopathy, um, uh, the, the reason this has become important is that leukocyte-rich PRP versus cortisone in a prospective randomized trial of 80 patients done by uh, Dr. Jane Fitzpatrick in Australia found that there was significant improvement in the PRP versus the cortisone. So I think the top two reasons to use PRP right now are gluteal tendinopathy, lateral epicondylar tendinopathy. The other area that's, that I, I commonly use it in, uh, not quite as successful, is patellar tendinopathy. Again, this is a very difficult clinical entity to treat. Um, but this is an example of one of my patients with some uh, longer term follow up, 48 year old triathlete unable to, to run significant patellar tendinopathy by ultrasound and MRI. And this happened to be one of my partners in, in my practice. Uh, and then over time, 
he had radical improvement in his ultrasound and significant clinical improvement in return to, to doing half Ironman triathlons. So again, ultrasound here is an excellent way to follow and to document whether or not the tendon is getting better. Um, this is just a clinic, just a fun video one of my patients sent. Yeah! Yeah. And so he was about, he was about six months. Uh, I hope people could see that video. Um, that uh, you know, he could jump six foot six. I don't know what that is in meters. Somebody's going to have to help me out with what that is in meters. But very happy patient after getting PRP for his patellar tendinopathy. Um, I started using PRP uh, in, in augmenting my Achilles tendon repairs. And this is a, a picture from probably more than 10 years ago now where I'm injecting PRP after repairing an Achilles tendon. Um, but I've also used it for chronic insertional and non-insertional Achilles tendinopathy. Again, ultrasound being an excellent way uh, to, to really follow these patients. So if you see here, and then you, you can look and see after a single injection of PRP, there was a significant reduction in pain and thickness of the tendon. Um, this is just another example. Um, maybe what I would like to pause for a second here before we go on and just ask, does anybody have any questions about sort of the first half? And that's with uh, PRP and tendinopathy and ultrasound. Maybe we'll just open it up to any questions. Is that all right? And then I'll come back to sharing this in a second. Okay, one question, Dr. Allen, that a lot of people are asking is, uh, you are an orthopedic surgeon. And why is it that uh, a lot of orthopedic surgeons are reluctant to use uh, this procedure in their practice? Oh, I think part of that may be due to uh, not believing the literature. I think the literature originally was not not really robust. I think the I think the literature is now robust in terms of value for PRP, in in not just tendinopathy but also for knee osteoarthritis. Um, and I think it's, I think early on, there wasn't a definitive answer as to, you know, what types of PRP were useful. I think that's become much clearer now. Um, I can't believe this has been going on now for close to 20 years, but um, that was, when was it? It was probably 2001 or 2002 is when I did, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly anymore. So, um, what, what, we, uh, what we ought to figure out now is how to optimize it uh, moving forward. Other questions? Any other of course, questions? Uh, uh, any, anybody who have questions before Dr. Mishra moves to the next topic? I have a, I have a question, doctor. In your practice, good morning. I'm from the good Philippines. Good morning. So in, in your practice, doctor, um, how many sessions do you do your PRP? Like um, for tendinopathies, is there, uh, do, you, do you take uh, into consideration the age of the patient aside from how severe the tendinopathies are? Thank you. Yes, so for sure, uh, I, I take into the account the age, the anatomic location, um, the, the actual, the other thing that we're gonna talk about next is I also, have found that vitamin D status in patients who have tendinopathy is important. Uh, and there's uh, emerging e evidence that if you are vitamin D deficient, you're, you have a worse outcome, for, for example, with a rotator cuff repair. So I don't have any definitive um, data on vitamin D and PRP yet, but I do think it's important, especially in any person of color. And I know I don't look like it, but I'm half Asian Indian. And there's a, a massive amount of vitamin D deficiency in the world. So if you, uh, if you have a patient who is vitamin D deficient, I try to correct that before I do the PRP now. And I think that does make a difference. I think it can, it can be improved. Um, you also have to take into account the body habitus of the patient. Uh, upper extremity use of PRP for tendinopathy is better um, than lower extremity, especially the Achilles tendinopathy if they're if they have uh, obesity or they have significant lower extremity dysfunction and tendinopathy, it doesn't solve it doesn't solve all the problems. Hopefully, that answers your question. Dr. Thank Allen. you, doctor. Thank you. May I ask a question? Are you okay? Yes, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Whether uh, yeah, 
I just you want tell, to know. Can you tell your origin? Yeah, you I just want are? to know whether uh, I'm Isiana from Jakarta, Indonesia. Thank you for this uh, beautiful lecture. Uh, whether PRP is successful for tendon rupture of, of more than 50%. Thank you. Uh, one, one more time, what was the question? I, I just didn't understand the uh, Is PRP is successful for rupture tendon, tendon rupture oh. of more than 50%? 50, more than 50% rupture. That, that's an excellent question. And I think that that is an area where you need to be very careful. Because if you have a, more than a 50% tear, it, PRP does not pull the tendon back together. So that's when I would go to using PRP in addition to surgery, especially if you have something in the Achilles tendon or the patellar tendon. Uh, the, the area where it's interesting right now is, is in the gluteal tendinopathy. Uh, and I'm seeing more patients with significant partial tearing of their gluteal tendons that actually do quite well with PRP. And I, I really honestly don't know why. Um, I need to have more experience with that. So for, for significant partial tearing of the gluteal tendinopathy, I think you can try it. Um, but if you have it in other places, you might consider doing surgical inter intervention in addition to PRP. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So if there are any other questions, I'd like to move on. And I think the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about uh, and I'll go back to sharing my screen here. I hope everybody can see my screen here. Um, can you see the screen now, everybody? Yes, Dr. Allen. Yes, we can see it. Excellent. Okay, so um, back at the beginning of COVID here in the United States, I was trying to figure out how I could help. And for those people, if you want, I put up a little video on YouTube. It's on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash sports medicine. You can find it there. But this is some, some interesting data, and I'd be very interested to what, what's going on in the Philippines as to whether or not the use of PRP could be meaningful for those patients who are vitamin D deficient, of which there's over a billion in, the, in, in worldwide, or 50% are insufficient too. So. Um, the reason this is interesting is that the data now that is emerging literally every single day suggests that if you are low in vitamin D, that you have a higher risk of becoming positive for the SARS uh, uh, virus. And if you look at this, which was just published a couple weeks ago, uh, and these are in the nanograms per milliliter. Uh, so if you're down here at 20, you have a much higher risk of being positive than if you go all the way up to 55. And this was a 190,000 patient sample here in the United States. And it showed that this trend was pretty, pretty impressive. This also was important for um, higher risk for black um, or Hispanic patients compared to white or Caucasian patients here in the United States. Part of that may be there's a higher risk for low vitamin D in those, in those patients of color. Um, also, the death rate for patients over 40 uh, and it was 20% for patients who had low vitamin D, 9.6% for uh, patients who had normal vitamin D, so twice the rate. Um, and this again, this was, um, this was uh, another paper that was just recently published. So what they found in, in even a third paper here is that there's a higher mortality risk uh, with low vitamin D and that vitamin D supplementation and the correction of vitamin D deficiency might be of major relevance for the reduction of the clinical burden of the ongoing and future outbreaks of SARS. So um, this is an area that's, the interesting part of it is that's the clinical data. If you look at, at, at the basic science data of why vitamin D might work, it's pretty fascinating. So vitamin D deficiency, as we know, uh, if you have any darker skin pigmentation or high BMI, so obese patients have low, lower vitamin D, um, there's vitamin D deficiency, which can result in impaired lung function, but then it affects both the adaptive and innate immune responses. And the reason this can be really unfortunate for COVID patients is that the pro-inflammatory cytokines can go up and then the antimicrobial peptides can go down. So you have, if you're vitamin D deficient, it really does put you at a higher risk for, for having a problem. Um, and then if you look really into the details of this, it's really, really fascinating. 
but but it really does vitamin D does affect your immunity in terms of possible uh, risk for lung fibrosis, that cytokine storm, or a higher risk of now testing positive for COVID uh, or having a more severe form of it. So what I'm suggesting, and this is what I would really like to talk about over the next 10 minutes or so, is uh, is what you, you think of in, in Asia, the Middle East, if this is even being discussed, because uh, it, it is something which I think could be done at a relatively uh, low cost to either just supplement people who are at risk or test them and then, and then uh, supplement appropriate at-risk populations such as the elderly up to a level of 55 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, and then I'm right now designing some prospective studies with a variety of people from around the world. And, and if anybody's interested in, in, in working on this, please message me or, uh, or send me a LinkedIn, mess <coughs> LinkedIn message because we're really trying to figure out the best places worldwide. Obviously, COVID has affected the entire planet. Um, and if there's a way of making a difference by doing something that is honestly, um, when I looked it up on Amazon, a couple of days ago, um, the retail cost of 1,000 unit oral dose was three cents. So um, supplementing patients is not super expensive. Testing could be expensive, but supplementation is not. So um, I appreciate you indulging me for that part of the lecture. Uh, I would, again, I'll stop sharing my screen now, but I, I would love to have a conversation uh, about ultrasound, about PRP, uh, tendinopathy or vitamin D in the context of COVID. Dr. Allen, thank you so much for that wonderful and excellent lecture that you've given us today. Uh, I have uh, one question though, and going back to your uh, first part of your lecture, you mentioned that ultrasound is even better than MRI. Uh, would you qualify that uh, statement? So, so I think it's I think it's better than MRI uh, in most cases because it's immediately available at the point of care. It's less expensive, and then you can put patients through a range of motion or under resistance. So I'm, I'm showing you my elbow now, but what I'll have I'll, I'll have resistance up here on the wrist when I'm doing the ultrasound, so I can see or at the shoulder too. We didn't talk too much about the shoulder, but I do a lot of shoulder, uh, I see a lot of shoulder patients. And so I can tell the difference between a partial and a, and a significant tear by ultrasound. And, and honestly, it's, it's 10 extra minutes in the office. Um, and, and the cost is way less. Now, it, again, you can, get, you can get fooled or miss things. So you have to be careful like that one picture I showed, but those are the reasons I use ultrasound extensively. I see. So thank you. Any other question from our participants? Any question? Uh, Dr. Allen, I've, I've seen a lot of benefits. Uh, uh, in your second part of your lecture, you mentioned vitamin D, and uh, indeed we share your opinion on the importance of vitamin D, uh, especially in battling against COVID. And interestingly also, uh, you mentioned about uh, the vitamin D uh, having its role on uh, if it's combined with PRP treatment. Did I get it right? Mm -hmm, that's, that's correct. What you're saying PRP with yeah PRP with vitamin D. So so you were saying that if the vitamin D is low, the the effect of PRP would be also less. Is that correct? Well, okay, that's that's my hypothesis. <laughs> so um, okay. <laughs> I don't have the proof of that yet, but what I've done, and, and, and it's a genetic problem. I was very low in my own vitamin D. That's part of the reason I became interested in it. And then I did some genome sequencing on myself and found that I have uh, two alleles for uh, sort of a defect in vitamin B D binding protein, which is the, the, the little protein that takes the vitamin D to the liver and then onto the kidney to, to be activated. Um, and if you are of uh, certain Asian populations, certain Middle Eastern po populations, and certain African populations, you have an increased risk of having this gene, uh, which puts you at risk for being low. Uh, certain Hispanic populations as well. So if I see people 
essentially if I see a person of color in my office, or if I see on x-ray significant osteopenia, I recommend getting a vitamin D level. And then I try to correct that before I do the PRP. Um, now I, I can't prove that that makes it better, but I will, I, I'm actually gonna try and at some point study the hundreds of patients that I've, I've treated and see if I can find a, a correlation. I don't see a downside though. <laughs> I see. <laughs> that, uh, so a lot of, of studies were involving the need for, for PRP treatment. And, and uh, in your experience, like you're an orthopedic surgeon, deciding between doing a knee replacement and uh, PRP, what would be your, uh, I would say, what, what would tip into in favor of doing PRP or in favor of total knee replacement? So a total knee, I what think- What is the break, breaking point? Uh... Well, the breaking point is the patient for sure. So if the patient, you know, the, the, the pain and, and disability of the patient is paramount because a total knee replacement is a good operation, but um, I actually don't do knee replacements anymore. So the people come to see me because they don't want a knee replacement. So I can, I sometimes do knee arthroscopy for, for some patients that have mechanical symptoms. Um, but, but in general, I think there's a massive opportunity. And this is again, another reason why I'm studying vitamin D is there's increasing evidence that if you are low in vitamin D, that you can have worse progression of your arthritis. So um, this whole COVID, vitamin D, tendinopathy, arthritis nexus is coming together. And so I, I do my best to try and help patients without the surgery if, if, if they don't need it. If they, if they have failed everything, including either PRP or cortisone injections and physical therapy and they're miserable and can't walk, that's when a knee replacement becomes a good option. I see. Yeah, because there are patients in our country who doesn't like surgery, even if you, if sometimes uh, they would just like to try doing PRP first. Would you, would you also do some kind of a regenerative, uh, I mean, uh, a, a surgical intervention? I don't think, I think there's, there's, a, there's a gap because people don't want a total knee replacement. I have done something called a subchondroplasty where you inject into the bone, either uh, some form of bone cement or PRP. That seems to temporize for a while, you know, a year or two. Uh, but even then it's not a definitive answer. Um, I think what we need to do is, is, is move up the food chain and people who are maybe in their 30s or 40s who have mild arthritis um, really work to, to decrease their weight, increase their exercise, optimize their vitamin D, and that would decrease the number of patients later who are at high risk for needing a knee replacement. Doctor, may I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi, doctor. So my question is um, more of for calcific tendinopathies. Sorry, yes. no, <laughs> calcific tendinopathies. Um, can you shed light if you're supposed, like for a shoulder calcific tendinopathy, would you rather do barbotage first before doing PRP? Is that something that you do in your practice? Thank you. Yes, good question. I have lots and lots of people with calcific tendinopathy of the shoulder. Um, I have not had a lot of success with a larger lesion. Um, I have some very tough patients and I've tried to break up the cal calcium with a needling and barbitrage and it's, I think it's torture. So I, I typically, if you have a one centimeter or bigger lesion or depending on you know, where it's located, uh, I, I typically have taken those patients to the operating room if, if they have failed perhaps a, a single injection. I, I just have not, honestly, I just need to be clear, I have not been great at breaking it up 
uh, in the office and I am very aggressive with the needle <laughs> and, and I, I know it's hitting it because I'm using ultrasound, but I, I think sometimes it's just too hard to do it, uh, to break it up. And I'm worried I'm going to break a tip of a needle. <laughs> so um, when I do, I, I've done lots of the surgery and the surgery is um, very successful at solving their problem. So that's a, that's a case where I offer them a, well, actually I don't do it anymore because I've had a few patients who were really mad at me because <laughs> we tried the barbitrage or injections and it failed. And I have several patients right now who have significant calcific tendinopathy. Uh, we're trying to manage it non-operatively, but more often than not, if they have significant or large pieces that are embedded in the tendon, I think it ends up, ends up needing surgery. Doctor, if, you will, if you will please indulge me with one more question. So yes. in cases like that, for patients like now in COVID, they're not very interested to undergo surgery. Uh, would you advise doing PRP just to alleviate some of the pain? Will that even work? Thank you. It can. It can. And so I don't think there's a, there, depending on exactly your experience, and it's not, not going to probably make it worse. Um, and I've had a couple of patients we were using extracorporeal shockwave, which is very painful. Um, and that did break it up in one patient, but incredible pain for five or six days. Uh, and then it, it essentially shattered the, the big lesion and set off a firestorm in her shoulder. So, so I, I think it's, it's an option, um, uh, but, but I, I, I've asked my female patients if breaking it up either with ultrasound or with a needle is worse than childbirth. And they all tell me it's way worse than childbirth. So obviously I can't speak to that, um, but uh, most of my patients are unwilling to, to do this now. I, I don't mind giving them maybe a, quarter, a single cortisone injection or PRP injection to alleviate their symptoms. I've, I've gone to using oral Toradol or, um, or sometimes a Medrol dose pack, methylprednisolone. I do think that a systemic uh, steroid sometimes is helpful, especially if they have any neck pain. So that, that's, it's, it's an interesting and unfortunately very common problem. Thank excuse you, me. Did you do a panic? Excuse me. Excuse me, I'm yes, sorry from Jakarta. Yeah, I'm sorry from Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Alan, I just want to know, are you combined, from, for knee osteoarthritis, are you combined PRP and hyaluronic acid? Thank you. I have not done that yet, but I think there's evidence to suggest that that's a reasonable, um, reasonable way to go. I think at some point um, it could be done sequentially, either HA before or after PRP. And I'm, I'm waiting to try and figure out what the optimal protocol, but that's an interesting way to do it. PRP seems to be a little bit better than HA overall. Again, but I would, I would um, challenge everybody to make sure that they're also doing some sort of exercise, that their vitamin D is optimized, their weight is optimized. Uh, it's been a very difficult thing in my practice to talk about that, but I do, I have some, some signs up in my exam room and if you, one sign that's helpful that for, for patients is that five times your body weight goes through your knee every time you take a step up and down stairs. So what I say to people is if you lose five pounds, your knee will feel like you've lost 25 pounds. So we don't, we don't, we shouldn't ignore those options uh, in addition to PRP, HA, or surgery if needed. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alan Mishra from Stanford University. We really, really appreciate your time with us it, today. It's and, an absolute uh, honor to be with you. And I, I, I um, hope to be there in person sometime when this COVID passes over. Jim, thank you for your time. Thank you everybody for being here and have a good evening. Or, or excuse me, good morning. It's a good evening here. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Dr. Alan, and have a good day and take care. Peace, Bye now, bye now, peace. Stay healthy. Bye. Thank you.